All right. Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Deborah Bookes, Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning here at Acton-Boxborough. Welcome tonight to the Acton-Boxborough Regional School District's Family Learning Series. It's great to see you. We're a small crowd tonight, but we really appreciate your efforts to be with us this evening. This year, the Family Learning Series is focused on building resilience. According to the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, the essence of resilience is a positive, adaptive response in the face of significant adversity. Or as the Fostering Resilience website states, resilience allows our children to exist in this less than perfect world while moving forward with optimism and confidence. We are thrilled again to be partnering with the Acton-Boxborough Regional School District PTOs, PTF, and the PTSOs, the Acton-Boxborough Special Education Parent Advisory Council, Danny's Place Youth Services, and the Acton-Boxborough United Way to bring you this year's topic. Their commitment to the students of Acton and Boxborough is inspiring, and together we can do great things together. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Anthony Rayo. For more than 20 years, Dr. Rayo has worked in the Department of Psychiatry at Children's Hospital in Boston and served as an instructor at Harvard Medical School. He currently consults with families all over the country and is the founder of Behavioral Solutions, located in Lexington. Dr. Rayo regularly appears on new segments pertaining to important issues that are affecting our children. He's been featured in documentaries for MTV and the A&E Network. He's been interviewed for articles in the New Yorker, the Chicago Tribune, the Boston Globe, and the Washington Times. His very human, common sense approach has appeared widely in publications from Newsweek to Scientific American. His very next book is on seven practices that promote personal agency. It will help all of us to stay focused on what matters, to achieve inner calm, to think more critically and increase confidence in an age of high stress. Tonight, he will showcase one of those seven practices, movement. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rayo to Acton Boxborough. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm incredibly excited to be here because I'm uh, going to be speaking about my next book, which is going to be released at the end of this year. And I want to speak tonight about a chapter from that book. And um, this is the first time that I've uh, presented it out to the public. So um, so I'm, I'm going to be very curious to get your feedback, um, particularly at the end. And we'll have some time for questions and answers. And perhaps we will have some opportunity to talk during, um, because it's a smaller group, which is really, really nice. The name of the book is The Power of Personal uh, Agency. And you know people, don't you, who just seem to have it together? Like you know people who are excellent agents for themselves, so to speak. People who you know are a little bit more confident. They seem to stay focused, they're more decisive, stay on goals. I started this project with another psychologist who's a, a management psychologist, uh, works in corporations. Uh, I work with kids and families and schools. Um, and each of us have wondered, what is it about certain people that we term it agency? These people that seem to be able to hold it together, what is it that they do? Are there things that we could learn from them? Are there teachable skills that can help us? So we did. We put our minds together on this, and uh, we wanted to know why are these people, these people that just seem to be able to be more resilient, they hold it together, they seem to make really good choices for themselves, they keep themselves on paths of their own choosing. Was there something that we could then share with other people? So we started a project together, and it, le it ended up with this book. Between the two of us, we have 40, probably at this point, frankly, 50 years of combined experience, and we started to sort of dig and figure out of the cases we were seeing, could we, could we name and identify, what are these people doing? These, these higher performers, more successful, uh, people who just seem to be able to manage the stresses of today so much better. We ended up from that also reaching out across the country, doing about 100 or more interviews, identifying people that we believed had high agency, personal agency. We interviewed them in depth. Um, we collected as much information as we could. Uh, people from all walks of life. You know, some of them are actually pretty notable people, uh, names you might recognize. Others, just folks that we felt really were able to follow their own path, were able to, to, to do things in the way that they felt was, was most in line with themselves. We identified 
through a series of all this information, what turned out to be seven practices, things that are teachable, things that you can teach your kids, things that we can do, things that we can do in school systems, in companies, corporations, organizations, we can do them in our communities. And it was very exciting. We then developed, along with a researcher at BU, a short inventory that assesses where you're at on each of these seven practices. We're going to have it in the book. It'll be online, free to take, when the book gets launched. And it's sort of a very easy way to assess, hey, how am I doing in each of these seven practices, the practices that we believe really people with high agency have. So we developed uh, what we call the Human Agency Project, and this book is really the beginning of it. But we wanna, we're going to move it out. We're going to try to be able to get some, some research going and more people involved in different types of communities, like I said, schools, companies, organizations. Here are the seven practices. I'm going to go through them real quickly. You'll see where movement fits in. The first one we call control stimuli. Bottom line, and this is why we start with it, if you can't control the stimulation that gets into your brain, in your head, or your kids, I don't want to be you know, negative about it, but you're kind, of, you're kind of a dead duck at that point. If your brain is overstimulated, you can't think for yourself. So that's number one. We spend a lot of time on that, getting people to be more and more sensitive to how much information is getting into the brains during this, the information age. And it isn't just stimulation that comes from screens, that's where most of it's coming from, stimulation from sound, from being in congested places. The second one we call associate selectively. We found that people with high agency were able to think about the people that they surrounded themselves with. The people that you surround yourself with will have a lot of influence on your emotions. Emotions, it turns out, are highly contagious. And we found that people who were able to think about their social networks, their groups, their communities, and decide where they kind of parked their brains, like were, were better in being able to make decisions for themselves. Move, which we'll showcase tonight, we'll jump to the next one. Position yourself as a learner, the fourth one. We found that people with high personal agency could sort of tamp down their defensiveness and they could be willing to, to hear other people's viewpoints. They could entertain competing ideas in their head. And it turns out with that, they had more knowledge when the time came for them to make best decisions for themselves. I think that the toughest one, which is MEB, manage your emotions and beliefs, I'm a cognitive behavioral psychologist. And in cognitive therapy, it's really front and center managing emotions and beliefs. If you can manage emotions, which can steer you in the wrong direction, learn what their signals really mean, you're gonna be a lot more powerful. But often it's the beliefs, the biases, the distortions in our thinking, which are quite natural to how we are designed, that are driving a lot of those emotional reactions which take us off course, take us off our goals, take us off the paths of our own choosing. The next one is called check your intuition. We found that people with agency were able to sort of get off to a quiet spot intentionally and allow the deeper ways of thinking. Parts of their brain that were doing a lot of the thinking behind the scenes sort of rise to the surface to inform their decision making when it was important. They weren't impulsive. They weren't just saying, oh, I'm going to do this because I have an intuition. They, they knew that they had to keep their intuition in check in addition to checking their intuition. And finally, it all comes together with this last one, deliberate then act. At the end of the day, you're going to make decisions. You want to be able to deliberate all that information as intelligently as you can. Use your critical thinking. And then when it comes time, you're decisive. And you don't turn back, and you don't regret, and you don't obsess. And we found that these were the characteristics we were seeing in people who had high agency that we interviewed in all these different situations. Now, it's MOVE that we're going to talk about tonight. Frankly, this is the one that surprised us the most. It's the one that sort of stood out as, well, that's kind of interesting, kind of a primitive thing. We move, we know what move is, we know what exercise is, what's the big deal? Movement, look at this list. Are you stuck? Are you tired? Are you sluggish, depressed, anxious, feeling hopeless, apathetic, distracted? Forgetful, problems, just look at this as like a, like a terrible checklist of symptoms. It turns out the people who use the practice of movement we discovered reported less of these types of conditions and symptoms. And it turns out that the research supports this. So you look at that and you begin to ask yourself, you know, should you just think like, ask your doctor 
if movement is right for you. You know, is, have, we been, have we literally been missing one of the most important basic functions of who we are as human beings that may have so much to do with what's going to help our emotional systems, help our neurochemistry, allow us actually to feel free and in charge of ourselves. Movement in all its forms, it's, it's a lot more complex. And when we interviewed all these people, the people that we felt had high agency, it was very interesting. They did more than the standard things. When you think of movement, what comes to mind? You think exercise, right? You think, okay, workout, swim, run, bike, whatever. maybe even the team sports that your kids play. It's a small, small part of what movement is. Exercise is efficient movement. It usually is scheduled, it involves equipment. Uh, we also have a tendency to want to put it off and it doesn't feel positive. A lot of the people with agency that we interviewed used a lot of outdoor exposure. So they got outside a lot. And what's interesting about getting outdoors, not only do they get to green spaces, which a lot of the research is showing us just allows our brain to feel more calm or sometimes energetic, sometimes more creative, they move more. When we're in interior spaces, there are chairs, right? There are couches, there are screens. When we're outside, you're going to move. You're, gonna, you're likely gonna stand, you're likely going to explore, you're likely to try new things. They knew consciously that it was good for their bodies and their brains to get outside more. We also found that they were able to use movement in anything and every, everywhere they were. So it wasn't like they needed equipment while they were cooking or when they were shopping or when they were you know, preparing to, to a meal or uh, just standing or stretching or uh, at work. Like wherever it was, they were conscious about it. And I think that was the difference. I mean, we hear all these things and we know we're supposed to do it, but people with agency knew they were to do it and they, they took their day and they made sure that they had exposure to all this. For their kids, they encouraged movement, you know, walking and wiggling and rocking. It wasn't like they were seeing it as hyperactivity. And that last one down there, Fidget, in the book, we go on record as saying, you know, we think the American Psychiatric Association has got to get its act together and it has to take fidgety off the list. Fidgeting is one of the symptoms that can lead to an ADHD diagnosis. Uh, because it turns out that the research is saying if we don't fidget, if we don't move, we're, we're, we're going to die younger, all of us. So in fact, it's a necessary built into the hardware, built into the software of human beings to move about. So we don't want it suppressed. People with agency, their kids, they didn't mind the movement. They encouraged it. They also found lots of creative ways to have movement in their life. And they knew that there was something about that that made them feel more alive, more creative. So there were things like in performance and acting and singing and, and dancing playing a musical instrument. And sometimes it was more of the classic types of things, you know, the classic arts. I mean, I know a particular young man who has a camera, got a really nice digital uh, single lens reflex camera from his, from his dad. And he's moving all over the high school taking pictures. He's doing it for the yearbook and the school paper. Um, he's going outside. It's, it's allowing him to, to experience a ton of movement. It's, it's allowing him to explore the world. I know kids that are doing videos and creating these, these wonderful little clips that allow them to move in all various ways. And then the other and sort of surprising part of what we found was that movement also involved, I don't want to say non-movement, but paired with or balanced with relaxation, restfulness, calming the system down, destimulating the system, so that these people were also able to do things that they knew they needed in order when it was time to use movement more efficiently. And they did it consciously. Um, that one up there called PMR, which you may not recognize, got mindfulness, yoga, deep breathing, tai chi, all these sorts of more mind-body-like types of things. Progressive muscle relaxation, which is an incredibly powerful set of simple cognitive techniques and behavioral techniques, you know, essentially you just, you breathe slowly from the diaphragm, you just let out a breath. I, I tell people it's nice to think of one word every time you let out a breath. So when I'm doing this with kids in the office or I've, uh, I'll make them an MP3 file and they can take it home, I say think of the word calm. Every time you let out a breath, calm, over and over and over again, just slow, nice, not shallow, not fast breathing, and then you think of each muscle group of your body. We usually go from head downward. So the head, the neck, the shoulders, the arms, the trunk, the legs, the feet, the toes, letting tension go 
over and over with each breath you let out. Uh, the research has showed that it's, it's, it's an incredibly powerful relaxation technique. We've used it in the treatment of migraine headache and all sorts of issues. So the benefits. I'm going to run through the, the physical benefits, some of which you already know. So I'm not going to spend too much time on those. The first three are obvious. You know, you, you hear about it all the time. Your doctors are warning you about it. Uh, you know, we're, 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 you, we're up on those. These, these last three, which I have sort of in that orange, um, lower back pain turns out to be the second leading cause of, di of adult disability in the United States. Preventable, almost entirely preventable by simple body movements if all through your life you're moving more, so you're sitting less, and also that your posture is excellent when you are sitting. This one, beating back dementia. A lot of people really didn't think that movement would be able to reverse or even just suspend or slow dementia. Well, it turns out that in a number of studies, um, it's showing, in fact, that with enough movement in older people, we're, we're beginning to see some changes that are really terrific. We knew that was true for depression. But there's actually physical changes that are taking place neurologically so that the, the gray matter, the volume of the cortex, can increase with a certain amount of types of movement, particularly in what's called the motor and the somatosensory cortex. The motor cortex is that strip that's in red up there, or it's kind of a pink. That strip, you have one on each side, is really what allows you to move every muscle consciously in your body. That's where all the, you know, the, the, the signals are, are fired in order for you to do that. The somatosensory is where all the inputs and all the sensory things from every inch of your skin, every sound, every taste, every, every visual input all comes in. Stimulates the brain, then there's the motor output. So the more you consciously move, you are stimulating the somatosensory cortex. So you actually have control over the, somat the somatosensory cortex by virtue of just consciously moving your muscles. Uh, myelination of uh, neurons, too, occurs. And this one, increasing longevity. A couple of years ago, there was a study out that said, look, and it was based on a large, large sample of people that had been followed over many, many, many years, thousands in the sample. And they traced for these people when they passed away, and they also were able to trace through surveys that they had been involved with, what were a lot of their life habits. One of the big predictors of early death was sitting, and it was sitting four hours at a stretch. Who sits at four hours at a stretch, right? It's pretty rare. It could be like a flight. You could be a Lyft driver. It could be something like that. Well, we binge TV. Um, sometimes we go on long car rides. At four hours, there's irreversible cardiovascular damage. I'm not going to say something horrible is going to happen at that moment to you and your kids, but be aware. Be aware. So that's doable, right? Except a more recent study has it a little bit more frightening. The higher frequency of 30 minutes or more of sitting were correlated also with a higher risk of mortality. 2017. So, you know, chances are you're not going to get up every 30 minutes. These are just a warning, a shot across our bows for you and your kids. Got to get up. All you have to do is stand. All you have to do is just stretch. You don't have to do anything dramatic. You will likely be adding years onto your life. Good news from the study, just interrupting this works. So just get up as much as you can. If you have to set a timer, just do it. Just keep motion going. Now, it's really this part that I think is really the central, central thing that means so much to me. And, and when we wrote this chapter, we felt that this was really where people needed to be. What are the benefits, not just of the physical, of the brain, but in terms of mental, emotional, it's really where we experience our lives every day, isn't it? First thing, really important, particularly for kids. Yes, it turns out that movement is associated with increased performance in both learning and creativity. Really interesting study. The brain scans on the left, their electroencephalogram, EEG readings, show a lot of brain activity going on. The ones on the right, which is the control group, and they were the ones that were just sort of sitting around. The ones on the left had just come in from 60 to 70 minutes of fit kids play. You know, so just standard kinds of play activities, some free play, a couple of basic games, nothing fancy. Sat all the kids down to do a basic set of cognitive tasks in front of a screen. And they found that the, that the kids who would just come in from exercise 
over the course of the testing did, did significantly better, just from having exercise within the hour. They could inhibit distraction and flexible thinking. Inhibit distraction, as it kind of implies, is just the ability to sort of filter, censor out something that may come in that will pull your attention off of what may not be as exciting to think about. Flexible thinking, which is a little bit opposite, is about being a little bit more connected to new ideas, being more creative. These are very, very valuable types of cognitive skills and abilities we want. We want that in the classroom. We want it in the workplace. The next one, improving your mood and stabilizing your emotions. You know, we know that exercise can make us feel good after the fact, right? You know, we, we know about endorphins if you do a lot of physical activity. But can it stabilize your emotions? Can it really have, as psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers, you know, talk about it, really like getting people to a much better place mentally, a more even keel? Basic electroencephalogram studies, again, show, look, you just take a walk. That's on the right. The activity in the brain. So much more is going on. Greater blood flow. More thinking is happening. On the left, during rest, a lot less. Let's take a closer look. We know, and we have suspected for a while, that if I go out for a run, if I go swimming, if I go to the gym, I, if I do enough physical activity, I actually can get away from my worries and my anxieties quickly. In fact, I know kids who, you know, from high school through college, who have terrible obsessive compulsive disorder, when they are running, when they are swimming, it goes away. What's probably happening is the body has to spend so much of its resources, the brain in particular coordinating all the movements, it doesn't have time for all of your petty, imaginal obsessions. So in a way, we do get a break just from that. I get that. that that's actually why we thought for years that physical activity was good, particularly for people who were feeling emotionally upset. Just, you'll get out of your head for a while and you'll get distracted, but it goes deeper. Neurotransmitters increase with physical movement. This is important. The first two you know about. Endorphins are clear, we know all about that. Helps with pain, norepinephrine like adrenaline, mobilized brain and body for action, but it's these two. Um, John Rady from the book Spark does a really nice job pulling this together. Boosts mood, improves the appetite and the sleep cycles. Serotonin and dopamine, most of the psychiatric medicines we use, we believe are, are, are affecting levels in the brain of those two neurotransmitters. And it turns out that rigor, uh, uh, vigorous exercise may be very, very much involved in providing what we're missing. Because for some reason, particularly in the United States, because of our perhaps low movement, we are suffering from a lot higher psychiatric issues than, than any other place in the world. Next, boost focus. Again, you know, we medicate a lot of kids every year for ADHD. We want to be able to have people to focus. That number is important, number 26. I want you to look at that number and I want you to memorize it. It's the amount of minutes it takes if you have a kid with ADHD, if they get physical activity for their ADHD to evaporate, to disappear, at least for a while. In other words, in studies, it's been shown that people, if they didn't know who had ADHD and who didn't, if they had all had 26 minutes or more of physical activity and you brought them into a situation where they had to focus, we're talking a school situation here, nobody could tell them apart. Enough so that the Atlantic in 2014 included this as well as some of the other research in is exercise ADHD medication. Well, yeah, it is, it is. All right, I'm gonna go even further. Enhanced self-control and studies with um, overweight college students, two months of walking and jogging somehow correlated to them reporting that they value delay gratification more. Like, it makes no sense. Why would movement be related to people being able to have enhanced self-control? Makes absolutely no sense. What they think might have happened is if you do stick to something like an exercise routine, something that isn't always pleasurable, does take time, especially away from something more pleasurable and enjoyable like eating or watching Netflix, you have delayed some gratification. And when it's done, it always feels good. And if you were able to follow that for a while, you may develop this incredibly important skill called delayed gratification just simply because you stuck with it long enough. And that's what they believed happened. Anybody knows the uh, marshmallow studies, the famous Walter Michel? Um, 
very, very worth calling up. Google it, look on YouTube, have a glass of wine while you do it. It'll be really fun to watch. Imagine just there's a bunch of little kids, one at a time, put at a table with a researcher with a marshmallow sitting on a little plate in front of them. They're in front of a one-way mirror, so it's being filmed, but the little kids don't know what's going on. So I'm going to leave just for a minute here, okay? And don't eat that marshmallow. If you don't eat that marshmallow, I'll give you two when I get back. And these are the classic studies that go back many, many years. And the, the footage is incredibly fun to watch because you just see kids just like they're just you know, they're squirming and they're staring at it and they're sniffing it and they're just, and then there are other kids who are just like, you know, I, I'm no dummy, I, I get it. You know, four, five, six, seven years old. It's cute, right? It's probably some interesting study. What's not so cute is that if you follow those kids six months, a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line, and they have, it turns out that who ate the marshmallow and did not wait could not do delayed gratification had a much less successful life in many, many, many ways of defining it. The kids who were able to delay gratification, more successful, psychologically happier, more productive, it turns out to be a predictive variable. So it's an incredibly important thing. If you can teach yourself, and certainly teach your kids delayed gratification, unbelievably powerful. So we think there's some way in which movement may be involved, keeping them on good, regular, exercise-like things with nice rewards afterwards. Now, finally, and this is really, I think, the heart and soul of at least what matters to me, is, is improving motivation. Rarely do people come in with that as the primary issue, that they want their child to be seen by a psychologist or someone. But it's, it's at the core of it. It comes up usually within a few seconds of, you know, well, we're not doing well at school. There's been a problem. There was a fight. Somebody bullied somebody. Um, but they seem to have low motivation. So the word motivation comes up a lot. If we could look at low mo motivation as just the starting point of something very serious that could happen if we don't deal with it. After a while, I start to give up. After a while, I start to feel helpless. After a while, I go from helplessness to hopelessness. I am now at clinical depression. In a lot of ways, if we could just back that up and if we could start with low motivation and if there's something we could do with it, could movement help us? I mean, think about the relationship between depression, helplessness, hopelessness, and personal agency. People with personal agency, kids with personal agency, teenagers with personal agency, they don't have that feeling, that, that despair, nearly as often, or they have it very rarely. So let's talk a little bit about movement and non-movement and why it relates to motivation and despair and helplessness. When you're depressed, what do you do? When an animal's depressed, what happens? The first thing is you actually slow down. Your movement starts to decline. You may kind of wrap yourself up, and start to socially isolate yourself. But you do become a lot quieter. You begin to do things, you do things in ways that are much less than you would normally want to. You know, you start to give up on things you used to enjoy. And then you are almost fully immobilized. People who are clinically depressed, they're just not moving. And we've had all, we've all had bouts of depression, which, you know, here and there is completely normal. So bottom line, you don't move when you're depressed. There's something, there's a relationship between these two. If that's the case, what if we inverted it? What if you could stop depression? What if you could reverse depression by moving? What if it went in the other direction? What's the relationship? What is it about movement and low motivation and apathy and helplessness and hopelessness and then this, depression? What is it? What's, you know, what, why? Why is it related? Why does movement matter? Series of now infamous studies were done. 1967, they began. Martin Seligman, who's the father of positive psychology, started out with research with animals. And with these animals, started with dogs, he would put them into cages where there was an electrified grid underneath their paws. 
and he would deliver electric shock, not enough to wound the animal, but to certainly make it clear that this was uncomfortable and you would escape and avoid. No animal would stay at this level of uncomfort. You've all had a little zap once in a while from something electrical, and you know that scary, awful feeling, that instinctive get off. Well, the dogs that are in a cage large enough start moving around. They try to find a spot that does not have electricity in the grid. Great. Terrific. Yeah, makes sense. What if I make the cage smaller? What if I actually put up a barrier? What if I put a harness on the dog and then I continue to shock that dog, which is what Seligman and his colleagues did? Multiple studies. The animal fights. The animal, like, just, just you know, if you've ever seen footage of it, which is hard to get your hands on, it is not pleasant to watch. You can just imagine an animal just, just trying everything to get out of a painful situation. Here's the part that's incredible. And basically, think about what this study is. He's suppressing movement. He's not allowing movement in a situation under which terrible pain or shock is going through the system. Eventually, you can take the harness off, if you do it enough, and the dog will sit there and take it with the harness off. Or if there's an area that they're back in a cage where there's a section that isn't electrified, they choose to just stay put they have learned to be helpless. When you look online, this is what you find if you call up the learned helplessness research. I, I think that most of, the, most of the footage has been scrubbed. Um, and, and I guess with good reason, because it's, it's, it's not pleasant, it's unethical. Um, so you get this like cartoonish thing of a beagle happy in a cage. It's not how this stuff looked. I remember early on seeing some of the footage, but it was more on 16 millimeter, uh, 16 millimeter film. And it was really unpleasant. It was, you know, everything from, you know, dogs and, 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 and cats and, um, and small, uh, you know, little mice and um, uh, monkeys and same results almost across the board. You deliver enough discomfort, pain, and immobilize someone, keep them so they learn to be helpless. So we think this is sort of the model for depression. When you're depressed, You've had a lot of things happen to you. You just, why bother? You just give up. You keep taking it because you don't believe anything you do will make a change. So think about what it's like when you're frustrated, sitting down, working out problems, and the emails are showing up, and the, and the texts are showing up, um, or you have nasty grams or something, and just, it's just this constant sort of, you are sitting as if you have sort of a harness on you while you're exposed to something that's really, really unpleasant. I mean, think about it. Your brain thinks you're trapped. I mean, yeah, part of your brain knows you can get up and move about. But as you sit there and as you take it, your brain literally thinks that you're being shocked, if you will. You're getting all this negative stimulation and you're not getting out of there. You're not moving. The natural thing, like the dog, would be to get up and move. So your creativity goes down, which means your escape plans go down, you're uh, more likely to have more adrenaline in your system. In males, we'll see more testosterone build up. There's no outlet for it, which movement helps. And then you become hopeless and down. You lose your optimism. You can kind of see why Martin Seligman turned that first set of experiments into positive psychology. Not to mention, by the way, when you're sitting for long periods of time, look at all of the physiological pain you're exposing yourself to while you're harnessed at your desk. Posture, lower back, myopia, just being on screens. By the way, it's, it's also increasing in children who are on screens more. They're more myopic, nearsighted, and headaches. So you're sitting there, and you're frustrated, and you're, and you're just taking it. You're basically the dog that's harnessed receiving shock. You're learning to be helpless. Any opportunity you can to move, you stand. You take it. You consciously put it in there. And that's what we found people with agency were doing. They just got up. You know, they could be in a meeting, just said, oh, I'm just take a quick stretch. I've got personal agency. I'm just going to do it. I don't care. They get up and they, it, it's almost like they own the space around them a little bit more and they take advantage of it. Small things every day. And it sort of boosted their sense of, of, of control in their life. All sorts of ways you can move in the office. Here's an example of some guy just doing his little push-ups. There's, there's, there's no excuse. And yet most of us do not do it. So more office examples, because the more that you know what to do, you'll be able to, for your children, make some changes.
I'm going to be speaking as well to the um, to the teachers um, in a couple of weeks, and we're going to go through a lot of more uh, sort of examples just in the classroom. But think about it. Look at any place you are in the space you have available to you, and I want you to use it. And I want you to start thinking about just a simple stretch, but it's got to be conscious. We find that, again, agency is related to taking sort of self-control measures. Use the stairs wherever you could. We, we found that people were using this a lot in a lot of the interviews we were doing. But they, a lot of them went outdoors. Every chance they got, they would do outdoor things. They would have walking meetings, which we find, or as they reported to us, about two or three people is about max for a good walking meeting because then it's almost like an entourage. But the uh, lunchtime walk clubs, all of it, they wanted to somehow get outside. They wanted their brains to be in the environment in which brains evolved for a million years. And then something just felt really natural and good and freeing. They are no longer tethered or harnessed. And they're making a conscious decision to move their brain and body around. And it's providing them a sense of heightened self-efficacy. Um, we know of one woman we spoke with um, in Boston, um, we talked for the book, who, um, you know, she, she worked in, the, 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 in a restaurant. And it was very, very busy. She managed it. And, and she told us that she liked to get out. And just, instead of just like eating something fast, or whatever, she, she would go either to the Boston Public Library or she'd go to the Trinity Church. And, and she wasn't there for, you know, for getting a book or knowledge or for prayer. She said it was the only time of her work day she says, I, I, where I wanted to be able to just be with my own thoughts. I, I wanted to just think for myself. I didn't want to be around so many things and needs and people and stimulation from all the screens that we use in the restaurant. Just, just I, I needed to literally have a moment to have my own thoughts. So she, she, she had agency. She, she was able to take herself and make that decision. Keep track of the digital overtime with texts, emails, the intrusion into your personal space. Balance it. Give yourself more time off. If you're just, it's something we're all, we're all having to deal with. Um, you know, as, as this time of year happens when private schools, for example, are making you know, their decisions and kids are making their decisions based on that, I'll get a lot of calls that come in later. I uh, had one last night. Uh, it just, it's just, you just have to keep working. And sometimes you're working well after you've left where, uh, the place in which you work. Oh, this is an interesting uh, thing. Um, uh, we're, we're working with a, a, a woman who has been a terrific uh, writing coach for us. So we'll sit and we'll plot out how this chapter should sound. And here are some of the main things and she'll help us organize it. She'll do some editing for us. She used to work for the Boston Globe doing a ton of writing. She teaches at Emerson. Her name is Leslie. So we're, um, we're at her house and we're, and, we're, and we're having a meeting over one of the chapters. And, and all of a sudden, you hear this ding, 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 ding. This little sound pops up. She gets up and she just walks out onto her porch. I'm like, Leslie, like, what's going on? She's like, well, I've set my computer just every, she does it every 30 minutes, which is, which is about right. And I just, no matter what, I hit the pause button. What I'm doing, I just break. Because being a writer in particular, she's, she's sitting there for just hour after hour after hour, mulling over sort of with the tension in her mind. Do I have the right word? Why isn't this passage working? Again, tethered, harnessed like Seligman's dog. I was like, Leslie, where, you know, where'd you learn this? She said, from your chapter. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know, it's fun, funny you do it. Like, I wasn't even using this myself. So I'm trying, I'm standing when I'm writing, and that's good. That's been really helpful. I get a lot more done, I just feel more energized. But I've got to start also breaking from things that are tough. I find that's really hard for me. Like, I, I tend to sort of, like, dig in, and I can, I can find that I can get myself all worked up and upset. And again, I have to remind myself, I'm, I'm Seligman's dog, getting shocked. I'm losing my agency. Your kids don't have the freedom you have, which you may or may not use. They're tethered. They're tethered, right? And we have to have them in chairs, and we have to have them in seats. I look at it so differently, though. You know, I don't look at it in the way teachers or administrators or even parents look at it. When it works, it's great, but particularly for boys, because my, you know, uh, my first book was about boys and boy development is boys have a much harder time in school. They're not built as well for early education. They have higher motor needs. Their language skills are not as developed. There's a whole host of reasons. There's not a lot of male teachers early on. There's all sorts of reasons why they don't do well. They get caught in a terrible early negative cycle 
of usually criticism or it could be self-imposed, it can be real, but just I'm not successful, I don't get it, what, what's, my, what's wrong with me? And then we find that it just gets worse and worse and worse as teachers try harder and harder and harder to motivate the kids sort of hunker down and they start to feel more and more and more learned helpless. So, you know, when I get a referral and I know that school is the issue, it's the first place I look is like, I need there to be some opportunities for this kid proactively, not when it's too late, all through the day to have some management of his or her own movement for them to feel that they have personal agency. But what we find is that if you have a lot of testing going on, that just complicates it even more. And now, of course, we're in the age of a lot of big data and a lot of testing. So with more testing, we find that we then move from frustration to learned helplessness. Because I'm stuck, I'm doing it, it doesn't feel good, why is everybody else getting it? And we do know that we have so many young men, particularly as they reach high school, leaving in much larger numbers than ever. And so many of them are not going to college and the ones that are are not succeeding in coming home. We have a, we have a, we have a crisis in male education. So to reverse it, here are some of the things to consider. So if I'm talking to a school, I'll say, look, let's look at your whole year. Let's look at your next <laughs> four or five months. How many tests are you planning? How many quizzes are you planning? How many moments of, 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 of they're going to be immobilized and they have to do something mostly with on a screen or, or a pencil and paper. I need you to cut those down or I need you to space those appropriately because those are times where we're having a lot of Seligman-like learned helplessness happen. How much time are they sitting? I want someone to record it. I want somebody just to do a quick analysis, you know, every, you know, maybe a couple of times a week just to get a sort of sample. How much time do we expect the kids to literally be in those chairs or not? And how many opportunities are there to move? And we've got, to, we've got to do better. We've got to do better. Standing at desks. It's in some schools, and I, you know, if I go to a, a particularly an all-boys school, it's not an issue. They don't have a choice. The boys have to be able to stand, particularly as they get into the later grades. And so the desks either accommodate or the kids put boxes on things. They allow them to sometimes sit on those or to, to kneel down or on those um, um, exercise balls. Um, those are great. They move the major muscles of the trunk and the limbs. Seems to really help the brain sort of spark up and, and be more focused. Lessons between breaks. If you want their brains to digest the material, you got to give them about 5, 10, maybe 12 minutes in between a good solid lesson of information, especially if you think it's challenging. Don't hop from one to the next to the next. The brain won't be able to digest the material, more confusion, more learned helplessness. In fact, I'm going to ask you guys, just stand up for a minute for me, just humor me. I feel bad because I, I think we've been, I don't know how much time we, you've been sitting. And just for a moment, that feeling of just you've been freed up from sitting. And you're, yes, we got some stretchers. We got some stretchers, we got a yawning. I was doing that earlier, whatever it takes. Just know for a moment you're free, you know? You can actually leave, but please don't leave. <laughs> just please stay. Um, and I just want you to think like this is the experience you want your kids to have. You want them to be able to have that ability when they feel it. All right, sit back down, <laughs> please. You know, and I'm, and I'm no dummy, right? I'm a psychologist, I understand how this all works. I know that I just bought myself another maybe 15, 20, maybe 25 minutes of your attention by doing that. It was a little selfish. I care about you too, and I don't want to take a day off your life, which may have happened if you were here for a solid hour. But I wanted you to know that, that I know that it's, it doesn't make sense to stay here. You were beginning to tune out. Maybe you were earlier, I hope not. But you were, you were starting to get a little fuzzy. And you're thinking right in the back of your mind, like, oh, I gotta go to yeah, Trader Joe's, I got milk, juice. Well, you know, you're trying to, like, you think about all the things your real life entails. Do you get a little bit of freedom, a little bit of a fresh start? Let's go. Oh, this is really great too, and uh, I encourage it as much as possible. Uh, and a lot of schools are now doing it, but they're doing it kind of in the much later grades. You probably know what maker spaces are, and in many ways, and they're somewhat based on the design studio model, which is from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, where it was sort of like an architectural design um, format where we brought people together, they worked out and defined what the problems might be. Um, they used all sorts of materials to sort of figure out what was the best thing. They'd go to someone who was an expert to help them solve the problem. A collaborative, energy-based, very movement-oriented kind of thing. iLabs, for example, are designed this way if you get to see what those look like. Anywhere you can, in your classroom, you could have this kind of model. So for example, you could see something like this. You know, standing, collaborating, all the sensory systems are engaged, visual, motor, an intensity you'll get that you won't get if you're lecturing. 
<laughs> like I'm doing right yeah, now. Like everything is like trying to crumble yeah. itself. You can do it at any age, too. Basic materials. A decision was made earlier as a group as to sort of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And we're going to go to teachers as experts, not necessarily tell us what to do, but help us solve the problem. Studio model, incredibly important. And finally, I want there to be more outdoor learning. I, I know I'm not a teacher. I have it easy. You know, I, kids come in, it's what? You know, 50 minutes to an hour, the door shuts, it's quiet. I don't know how teachers, I don't know how teachers do it. But we've got to get them outside more. And actually, if you think about it, many of the topics, particularly in the science, technology, engineering, it's actually a lot of the stuff is based on what's outside, not inside. I'm on the uh, board of um, the Discovery Museum, which is going through a wonderful renaissance. They, um, and by the way, they just opened up a, a beautiful, I mean, it's in your backyard. It's literally down the street, folks. This is a world-class, small, hands-on children's museum. It is, it's, it's world-class. And it's expanded just recently in, in new ways. This is Discovery Woods. And um, the learning is based on being outside trails and paths, and that's a, a terrific tree house. It's about five, 600 square feet. So that with parents and high accessibility, you can bring people together and they can have experiences. The, what's interesting is they've been tracking, uh, how long do people stay? They stay a long, long time. Y you wouldn't predict that. In fact, we used to have board meetings, we were thinking like, we're just wondering, this is a bit of an experiment. What is this really gonna look like? It isn't like there's a million things to do and buttons and things to, you know, to, to press. and and the kids are spending a really, really long time, and parents are interacting a lot with their kids. The new museum has a ton of movement built into it, um, twice the space of the old one. It's really quite something with a lot of new great exhibits. So more outdoor learning. Um, so I want to just spend a few minutes on like how we even got here. I don't mean like how you literally got here, but how we got to the point where, particularly in the United States, we are non-movers at our own uh, risk, physically, mentally, psychiatrically. So check this out. We're at about 90% of our day is inside now. 90%. It's, it's not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be outdoors a lot more. And kids, with the exception of sometimes organized sports that meet outside, in terms of their just natural free play or being outside, just down to 30 minutes a day, not healthy. And I don't mean just for the physical body and some fresh air, for their sense of personal agency. I'm free to move. I'm free to explore. I make decisions for myself. I own this space around me. I consciously take it. There's an economic reason. When we went through a boom, the houses got bigger. The houses got really big. Look at the square footage difference uh, in the houses. Houses are where we don't move. They have beds. They've got chairs. It's cozy. There's, there's more screens. There's more technology. It's where the food is. You know, for the most part, if you don't want to move and you don't want your kids to move, just keep them indoors. Works beautifully. If you want to move, you got to go outside. You will, you're going to move. You're not going to just stand in one spot. And you're probably not going to find a nice little cozy chair. But there's other reasons that predate that, that Americans really, really miss the boat. Well, I'll say they miss the boat, but let's see what you think. The TV dinner. Brilliant idea. I, now I love the TV dinner, don't get me wrong. My parents used to go out and I would end up with, it was like a Salisbury steak thing or, I don't know, and the, and, the, and the turkey one had like a little cobbler in it that was awesome. I loved it, it was great. But think about the marketing, forget, forget the marketing, look at the message. The TV is now really popular. So you're gonna sit and you're gonna stare at this thing for a long period of time and now you're gonna eat while you're doing it, but you're not going to make the dinner. You're not going to shop for it. You're not gonna chop it. You're not gonna set the table. You're gonna like just pump this thing into the oven and boom, it's gonna come out. It's mostly processed and, and you're gonna sit while you're glued to the TV. Brilliant marketing, incredibly dangerous as a model. Well, and then of course, I remember when my mom got her dishwasher, yeah, she threw her apron out and she was free. And, and you get this with a sense of like technology coming in and helping us. Now don't get me wrong, I will not give up a dishwasher, but, but, how much time did we used to spend getting, preparing, cooking, chopping, even cleaning after meal? There's something nice. Have you ever had like an experience where you've had sort of a group house and you've shared it with some other families and you've done something over the summer and you know and uh, and you just realize everybody participates and gets involved in this more discussion. There's mobility before and after the meal that now is completely missing because of convenience. But this is when it was game over when the home computer showed up. 
everything changed. I showed this picture the other day to a, to a, to a, a guy who was probably like 13, 14. And I said, I said, you ever see one of these? He said, what is that? And I said, what do you mean? It's a computer. He said, it's so weird. He goes, he says, what's that thing on the left? Like, it looks like a growth, you know? I said, that's where the, the floppy disk is. Oh, he says, was that like a record album? I was like, oh, you know, forget it. At that point, you know, I, 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 yeah. So this is really where we're at now, right? So screens became incredibly cheap unbelievably amazing to watch. You walk into you know, Costco or BJ's, you just, you're just mesmerized by the televisions and the quality. So now we can have bigger ones and more of them. And then they went to sort of this mobility and lighter ability to take stuff and be able to connect to internet and take our work with us. And then we went to the handheld, which let's face it, we touch our handhelds more than we touch people we love, right? You do. And actually you look at them more than probably your own kids. <laughs> you know, you look into the faces of your handheld more than you do the people you're closest to. Just saying, I mean, I do too, it's just how it works. But this is where they got us because when you're engaged in any of these, don't think you're getting knowledge or you're working and you're developing your agency, you're losing it because you're immobile. Chances are you can't be that mobile when you're on any of these devices. The other piece is what are you putting in your brain, right? Maybe you think you could watch the news even though it's just an endless loop of negative stuff and, and I'm a big news watcher, so I'm guilty of this. And maybe you think it doesn't have an influence on you, right? Think again. A week from yesterday will be the fifth anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombing. And we all remember that. We all know where we were. It doesn't even, oddly seems five years seems long, but not that long. I don't know, it's very, very strange. We all have stories about it. Most of us were glued to TV sets. Some of us were down on many of those streets where there was chaos and confusion and people talking about horrible things and seeing ambulances and seeing blood. And A researcher cleverly got in touch with people a couple of weeks after that horrific event, interviewed them to find out where were you? Were you watching it on TV? How long were you watching it on TV? Or were you down there? What was your experience? and then gave them some, some basic measures of, of stress and anxiety, there are higher levels of acute stress disorder, PTSD-like symptoms in people who watched it on television than people who are down at the event. Completely unpredictable. Why? Well, certainly the endless loop of terrible things got into the brains of these people. I think the piece that's not talked about in the research is they were immobilized. They were not moving. They were sitting on a couch, on a sofa, and just receiving it. Again, tethered, harnessed, like a dog getting electric shock. Watch. <laughs> Be careful what you watch. Be careful how long you watch. The simple way to really fix this is, and, and this was where they found around six hours of exposure really had clinical levels. Like this is where the big difference occurred in the two groups. But the, the, the way to fix it's relatively simple. You know, you've got to physically get up and you've got to get away from those screens. You may have to create a timer. What I think is useful is sometimes I'll actually take a day off from news. I mean, look, if something big's going to happen, we're going to hear about it. You know, we're in the digital age. It isn't like, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's Walden Pond and, you know, back in the day. Like, I, I, I'm going to know. Literally take a complete break from sources of intense stress, including radio, for which you are immobilized while you're receiving those data inputs. Insert frequent movement, which really is using your agency, your personal agency, wherever you can. I'm going to stop just for a minute and see if there's any questions so far. I'm going to give you some time at the end, but anything there where, do you folks feel it too with the idea of being exposed to the media, being exposed particularly to things that are happening right now and the tension in the country, what the effect is on you physiologically, what the effect is on your mood, do you feel it? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of this extra layer of intensity that we've been experiencing, you know, um, and it's, it, it doesn't seem to be getting any better. It just seems to be ratcheting up or tightening up. So, again, maybe to increase our sense of control over our own lives, to be able to get the noise out of our heads, to be able to manage our emotions and our beliefs, maybe really using movement a little bit more. It's the one conscious thing we have that's available to us, nobody can take away. The other thing that's really important, 
is that we found in this group of people that we interviewed, as well as in all the cases that we went over, that people with agency, or when we're a person with agency, we, we tend to know when not to push ourselves. We nap, we rest, we take a break. So, you know, they're kind of things that we kind of don't really value as much. Like, for example, resting and napping are kind of looked down upon, unless you're a little baby. <laughs> You know, and yet some of the smartest, most productive people say, and, they, and they're able to do it, say, you know what, I think I need a break right now. I'm just going to take 10 minutes. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to go over here and whatever. And then, I, and then let's meet because I just need like a little break. I know that my brain is overstimulated. I know that I need to sort of get my energy levels back up. So they, they alternate. They balance spending energy with rest. We have some uh, parts of the book that are about really respecting your biological needs, knowing your health statistics, knowing more about your body. Being, a lot of people describe that they're so busy in their lives and, and they're, not, they're just not aware of their, their, their physical state anymore. They're just sort of just motoring through, doing thing to thing to thing. There's some great examples of where, and touching, inspirational examples of where when someone's mobility has been taken away from them for some reason and they still find agency. They still find a way. Agency finds a way. A couple of years, actually a number of years ago, uh, I was at one of the big hospitals downtown for a meeting, and I'm leaving, and in the lobby is this, this very, very sweet young lady with her mom. She has cerebral palsy, and she's selling some, um, some little cards that she's making. And she, she has a little non-for-profit, um, and um, uh, Christina Powell's her name. I don't know if you know who she is. Um, I mean, I, I like to collect art. I don't collect expensive art, although I, once in a while I dabble. But I, I have a hard time leaving anything. So I look at everything. And I'm, so I'm looking at some of her things. And I, they're like little cards. And, I, and I, was, I was talking with her and chatting with her. She was just a lovely person. She has created this non-for-profit to go into hospitals, particularly things like, you know, kids were... Uh, places where kids are chronically ill and may be dying or cancer wards and, and, and just sort of bring her art in and interact with them and to give them as gifts. And, um, and, and, and the staff are, are just loving this. They're just seeing that people are feeling so much more hopeful and their moods are increasing. But anyways, I looked and, I, and I, it's like thinking, you know, Christina, do you have anything a little bit less Matisse? You know, yeah, it's like, this is great. And she had this and I ended up with these. And I actually just have one left. I have to order more. They're just little gift cards that I, I just loved it. And to watch her and how she has to hold um, the little brush, and her mom helps her quite a bit. Um, she was uh, adopted um, from Peru, just a couple of days old, and it wasn't until a couple of weeks later she got the diagnosis. What's interesting is I ran into her in a different way. Um, uh, my co-author and I, uh, wanted to know a lot about technology, particularly in the early chapter of the book, Control Stimuli. So we were able to get a tour, a really nice tour, of um, the Media Lab at MIT. And to look at sort of like progress, technology, um, digital thinking, all that. Um, and we came across, um, it, it, the person who was taking us around, his name is Tal, um, I hope I'm not mispronouncing his last name, uh, Akatov, I think is how you say his last name. A uh, gentleman from Israel originally. Um, he figured out a way to help people who are lost their mobility to be able to paint. And Christine, uh, who's now seven, eight years maybe later from when I had first met her, was one of the people that was helping him do this. She wasn't there at the time, but I noticed her artwork in his office. This is um, a video clip that's on YouTube um, that Tal uses when um, he's doing a, a TEDx talk. Don't forget, we are all unique, but we are the same. I walk slowly, but I'm really just like you. When I did try those robots and MIT with... That's tall, right there. And thought of myself and I was not supposed to walk and talk. She was not supposed to walk and talk. She was told, mother had been told that um, she probably was not gonna walk or talk. Um, and that's what she learned was gonna be the case. And well, did she prove them wrong? She found a way with her limited movement. There's other examples. Joni Mitchell contracted polio at nine years old, was hospitalized and immobilized um, for recovery for a long time. 
um, she described her, her spine in a, I think it was a, uh, an interview in Rolling Stone as twisted like a, like a, like a train wreck. Her spine was twisted, twisted like a train wreck. During that time, she decided to find her voice and she started singing and she wanted to perform and she was driving them. Uh, the, apparently the kid next to her in the bed was just driven crazy by it and hated it. She was only nine years old. Joni Mitchell of all people. So in a way, it's like you, you remove someone's physical mobility. Movement shows up in other ways. Agency continues. Um, I had a close encounter uh, with this gentleman um, years back. I was uh, at Children's Hospital and I was uh, rushing up. You know, if you've been in the sort of main area of Children's, it's changed a little bit now, but I'm ru running up the stairs and there's a large entourage of people coming and there's a, there's a, there's a gentleman in the wheelchair, that gentleman, who's um, just coming right at me and I just, I just like, oh my God, Stephen Hawking, like what's he doing here? He was there to talk with and interact with some of the communication disorder staff and, and patients, um, had a huge entourage. He was, you know, he since has passed away, but he, he, was, um, he was expressive then. And uh, we met eyes and, and I, just, I just completely froze. I was like, this, is, this guy is just science royalty. Um, and he just zoomed right by me. I just, I just stopped. I became immobilized. He just literally just puttered right by with all these people behind him. It was just a really, really terrific thing. Another great example, using just such minimal movement and pushing through is human agency. Final thought. I'm going to put something up on the screen. I just want you to read it. Um, and I think even in the back, you'll be able to, to see it. I just want it to sink in. I just want you to like have a moment to, to see this. Your kids are experiencing this. We start off the book, actually, with the observation that we're in the middle of climbing anxiety, an anxiety epidemic. We believe that that's actually what is bringing down personal agency. The more anxious you are, you're less confident. The more anxious you are, you can't think for yourself. You can't motivate yourself. And anxiety has been climbing, at least since the 30s. It's being tracked every year. In the population, it's mostly America. America is the most anxious place on the planet, according to the World Health Organization a couple of years ago. So your kids today, you know, when I see kids and I see them with those backpacks, those heavy backpacks, or the kids that are coming in with all sorts of, uh, you know, injuries related to the high specialization of sports, the orthopedic problems, you know, the slings and the casts, I, I, I realize they're, you know, they're suffering under the weight of so much, so much high achievement. They're carrying around, but the invisible backpacks, the invisible braces are, 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 is anxiety. So it doesn't matter what you say. You can say a hundred times to your kid, don't worry, don't worry. You don't need to get A's. I don't care. Just want you to do your best. It means nothing, particularly when they're a little older, because it's what their peers think, and it's what the society has demanded of them. So look at the relationship. We found a relationship here that we think is so hopeful. We know that anxiety is climbing. We know that it's taking over and it's causing all sorts of problems, particularly for people in the United States. We found that if you increased confidence, anxiety was low. You couldn't be confident, optimistic, call it what you will, and anxious at the same time. They're almost like opposite neurological tendencies. They work on a seesaw sort of way. The opposite is very true. The more anxious you are, you're going to be less confident. That's powerful because I can get you to someone who will give you a medication to lower your anxiety or I can boost your confidence. In my work, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, I tend to find ways for kids when they're stressed, when they're anxious, when their self-esteem is low, to boost their confidence. I, I'm not as interested in bringing down, ameliorating, as we say in, in the medical community, the symptom. I don't want to attack the symptom. Sure, I want to give relief, but I want to attack it from a different way. That's where we think personal agency fits in. Now look at this. We know that if we increase movement, we bolster confidence. And in turn, anxiety becomes lower. And that's what I want you to remember. I want you to remember that as the last part of why movement is incredibly important. Okay? I'm going to stop there. Uh, any questions? Any thoughts? Any reactions? just so mesmerized you. 
Yes. So I have three teenagers at home, and um, when they were little, they used to go play out in the yard a lot, and now that they have phones and a ton more homework, and friends are all busy at other activities, I mean, they just... You've just perfectly described the dilemma. They're normal, healthy kids, but they're under uh, chronic low movement, um, almost as if they were sedated or tied down or tethered or harnessed to something. And you're right, I know parents who are trying to get play dates and they can't even arrange them because the other kids you know, have so many activities and so much tutoring. And we're on a terrible treadmill that is just climbing and continues to. Uh, nobody wants to be the first to, to sort of slow it down. Or if they try, it's, you can get ostracized for it. It can be really, really, really hard. Um, you know, anybody who's a teacher, block your ears. Um, the homework, frankly, you know, as long as they're trying, as long as they're putting some effort in, stop it, suspend it, and get them into something else. You know, because the research that I see doesn't show that the homework adds up to much in the very, very long run. I'm not saying that it's not important, particularly in the older grades, it's incredibly important. But all that extra time, if they're sitting for longer hours without a break, they're just sort of like pushing themselves in to perform on something. So they become hyper excellent performers. But it's a fast clip. You know, we're in very excelled areas, particularly in the East Coast here. Keeping up is really hard. The alternative may be worse, I don't know. That's why we medicate a lot of kids, particularly boys, with you know, performance enhancing drugs, which are ADHD meds, psychostimulants. But you have just literally put your finger on it. That's right, that's right. I think that you as a parent, the personal agency part is, you're in charge. You have to make decisions. Sometimes it's, they're highly unpopular with your kids. Phones are off as soon as you come in the door until this is done, then you get this, this amount of time on your phones so that we, we brutally manage the stimulation. In the first chapter, a lot of talk about that for parents, just brutally take control of the stimulation. You think that having a phone is normal. You think that all these screens are normal, or having computers. It's only normal right now. We're in the middle of an information age. You know, during the time of the transportation age, during the agricultural revolution, a lot of people got hurt Things failed, there were a lot of problems. It's a series of upheavals that you've got to keep a steady, steady control over really what is getting in their brains. And you'll be really unpopular for it. So if you like a fly in the wall and you were in my office, boy, you should just see the looks. Kids are like, you know, they really like coming in, they really like me until we have this discussion about screens, particularly screens and phones and social media. Yeah, brutal, be brutal if you have to. Yes? Well, some of them are like preschool, you know, preschool all the way up to, you know, eighth and sometimes high school. Yeah, I'm going to be speaking, do we, is it going to be elementary, the elementary? To start, <laughs> to start, yeah. Um, there are so many opportunities and so many ways to bring some of these most basic concepts. And then, you know, once our book is out, we have all these other ways to bring this into, uh, say, an educational setting. Um, you know, who doesn't want to achieve these things that other people have been able to achieve? Um, you know, these are teachable practices. Yeah. The boy, uh, way of boys, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. I've, a lot of, you know what a lot of parents have? A lot of parents have. Um, it, you know, I, it must be tough to be the teacher, right? To, to sort of juggle that and to, you know, 20, 30 kids and uh, get through the programs and, um, and for the most part, it works really well, but um, it's, it's a lot of energy and a lot of work. I, you know, I think the sort of the, the untold piece is like, what's this like for the administrators and the teachers? How hard this is on them too. They're trying to hold it together, um, but um, the, the kids are like canaries in a coal mine. They're the ones who show the symptoms first. Yeah. Oh no, just, stre <laughs> just stretching, just fidgeting. <laughs> awesome, that's great. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah. No, 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 absolutely. Again, you, you've raised all the, you know, all the pieces are so interesting in um, teachers are more likely to see ADHD symptoms than parents and certainly much less than we see in the office. So the situation and setting, you're comparing these kids to other kids and their behavior and every teacher has a bias as to what his or her, and it tends to be her, uh, about what particularly these boys may be okay with in terms of like how much motor activity is okay. Um, so there are all these variables that get involved and the research is lining, lining up. It's very interesting. But for the kid who shows up at the office with the, the sad face or feels negative or feels like why should I bother and I give up or I become oppositional and act out. 
those kids get more serious psychotropic medications if you don't watch what happens to them. Um, you know, so we, we have to be very, very, very judicious with any kind of use of medication, in my opinion. Try everything else first, including maybe a different placement. I've been amazed because, you know, on my side of it, my side of the equation, shifting the environment has been unbelievably dramatic in all of a sudden there's a complete difference in behavior output. You know, we have an assumption, right, that everything a child does has something to do with their brain. True, the brain is this predictive, reactive organ that's always doing stuff, but do we think it could be the other way around? Could the environment be causing the behaviors that we're seeing in the classroom? We go immediately right to the medical model, which is there must be something in the brain, something in the brain chemistry, you have the disorder, here's the ADHD, and these medications are fantastic, they work, they work on everybody, they're performance enhancing drugs. So yes, your kid will sit, will do great, looks awesome, but the long-term data don't show that they end up in a different place, medicated or not. Now there are examples where I even push parents, hey, I think maybe some medication for this first year could be good, but I want an exit strategy and let's get them off by, by the summer. Let's not make this a long-term forever thing, but I'm thinking that this is a really tough year and, it's, and I can see his self-esteem going down. So it's a you know, case by case thing, very, very tricky. I really like the way that you put all those variables together. Really gives a flavor for how complex this is. And there's no, there's no enemies here. There's, there's no one side or another. This is a very tricky thing. And the more that we excel and move fast and expect things, it's gonna be trickier. Any other thoughts? Appreciate this. Yes. Yeah, well, you know what, I would, I would say you might ask the question a little differently. You might get a different answer, but that, is what I get in the office as well. What I do is I don't usually start with how school tell me how this. I usually get them in some sort of motor movement activity to go back to movement. So uh, next to my desk, I have little puzzles and little things and tchotchkes and, you know, and if they're sitting right next to me, they automatically grab. The kid is kind of quiet and sort of looking a little bit, you know, out of it. I take these little cushy balls and I just start tossing them at them. They toss them back. As soon as they're engaged in physical movement of some sort, they start to talk. So, you know, we tend to ask the question right on the ride home or as soon as you come in kind of thing. I'd get them involved in something, do something else, and then return to it later. Try it just later. They also have their, uh, you know, they're kind of like a little bit suspicious, like, what are you looking for? <laughs> you know? So sometimes it's how we do it. And, you know, one of the other things, one of the other tricks is don't make too much direct eye contact. It's not like this. It's more like we're parallel playing, we're talking, we're doing something. And now you're more likely to talk to me if you're a boy. Up. Yeah. We find this in Japan, we find this um, in, in, um, in Norway, in Sweden, in Finland. Um, a tendency to go, I think it's like 30 to 40 minutes break for five to 10 minutes, always. And they get to do almost anything they want. And they tend to have movement oriented things. So there's, there's mats, there's things, there's a ball, they can run outside, doesn't matter. And they, and they find that that just allows these kids to feel a bit more free in control of themselves. And that material is sinking in more. So it, it looks different on the ground. Like if you look at the big variables, yes, they have TVs, they have, but the amount of time sedentary, the amount of time indoors, the amount of time actually on screens is probably less in other countries for the most part. Not all countries, but it's a great question, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Um, I learned this lesson early uh, in a talk that was uh, down in Boston. Um, they had me come in to talk about the boy book and just why is it that we're seeing so many of these boys just lining up in, in the principal's office every day? And, and they, somebody just sort of said, wait a minute here. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Um, most of these were boys of color, and, and they're the highest at risk to, you know, be expelled and suspended and get in trouble and, and then medicated with heavy psychotropics. So uh, it was interesting. A couple of the male teachers and some of the female teachers got behind this idea of, and they did it really on their own, and it was, it was a while back. It was probably like eight, nine years ago. As soon as a kid is in trouble, they take them and they say, you need to move your body. I was like, that's, you know, you got in trouble because you made a bad decision. You need, you got to get this out of your system. Come with me. Let's take a run. And they go out into a parking lot, you know, inner city Boston. Do a lap. Awesome. Excellent. Good job. Okay. How does it feel? Does it feel good? Let's go back in and try it. And so they tried this and it reduced significantly. So one can then make a case that the adrenaline levels, particularly of these kids in inner city lower socioeconomic situations, some traumatized, are, are, are just adrenaline junkies, just, you know, and, and with no outlets for it. Um, and interpreting it for them as, you know, your body to this because you, you got too much of this in your system, that's why you made the bad choice, is better than you make bad choices, you're in trouble. Um, but they were able to 
to control it a lot better. So that was a lesson for me about the idea of removing physical movement. Um, and I hope that after this talk, that you know, and when I speak with the teachers, they'll, they'll think twice about that. It's a great way to punish a kid. But I think what you'd find if you really looked at the incidence rates is that you're going to buy yourself some problems later, particularly with that kid, that you're going to end up with more difficulties by removing the motor movement as a way to, to motivate them to be better behaved, which usually means sort of just listening or sitting kind of thing. That's a great question. Anything else? Terrific. Uh, oh, yes, one more. One more. I'm sorry, what? It's called The Way of Boys. The way of boys, promoting the social and emotional development of young boys. In fact, I was here last year um, talking about it. Uh, and most of my talks are, are that, and we're moving into a different book, but I'll be doing those talks too from time to time. Anything else? Folks, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you.